Good afternoon. I'm Linda Lehrer from the Aspen Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to the Alma and Joseph Gildenhorn book series. March is Women's History Month, and 2021 continues to celebrate the courage of those women 100 years ago who fought for the right to vote, to have their voices heard in decisions that affect them as citizens of this country. Today's author continues the tradition of courageous women speaking out about an issue of importance to the health and well being of women, and as we'll find out, of men as well. The topic is not an easy one to hear about, even harder to live with, but it is one that needs to be discussed, to be brought to the light if it is to be stopped that is, domestic violence. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the US. While the majority of these are women, men also suffer from domestic abuse, which can be emotional, psychological, sexual, as well as physical, and cuts across educational, racial, and economic lines. Even more troubling, according to the UN Population Fund, last year, 2020, there was a 20% increase globally in domestic violence. Today's author, Tanya Selvaratam, is a writer, an Emmy-nominated producer, and has been an activist for 25 years in the areas of art and social justice. Her book, Assume Nothing, a story of intimate violence, chronicles her own encounter with abuse and how it took away her voice. She also shares the, her struggles to gain it back and her decision to use it to help other women find their way to freedom. Joining Tanya in today's conversation is Carrie Mae Weems, who through her art has investigated family relationships, cultural identity, sexism, class and political systems, and the consequences of power. Her work can be found in both public and private collections around the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in MoMA in New York and the Tate Modern in London. Before turning the program over to Tanya and Carrie Mae, I want to remind you that you can submit questions by clicking the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And thanks to our friends at Politics and Prose Bookstore, you can purchase Tanya's book at a 10% discount. Information about how to do so will be provided at the end of the program. And now I'd like to turn things over to Carrie Mae and Tanya. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Linda and Tanya. It's great to see you. Always. It's really <laughs> wonderful. Congratulations. It's Women's History Month, Women's History Month. And at the same moment, your book, of course, has come out, which I think is really wonderful, Assume Nothing, which I think is just a fantastic title. And, you know, I wanted to know, um, how are you? How are you doing? I am happy to be with you because as you know, you were with me at the beginning and throughout the journey that is chronicled in the book. I'm also really grateful to the Aspen Institute and the Gildenhorn book series for hosting this because my first public appearance was at the Aspen Ideas Festival in the summer of 2018 after the story came out and it's an experience that I describe in the book. So this feels like, uh, so right now at this moment, I am happy and grateful in the big scheme of things. Uh, I can't wait to take a vacation and dance all night in person. <laughs> How about you, Carrie? I'm feeling pretty much the same way. <laughs> I've been uh, I've been fortunate now enough to you know to know you for a number of years now. We've worked together on a number of projects. Uh, we've been friends maybe for over ten years, maybe maybe more. Thirteen. Part of my life for a long time, and I 
I cherish you. And that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to know how you were. But I thought, you know, I know you well, uh, and I know your background, but I was wondering if you might share a little bit of your background with our audience so that they understand more personally where you come from, who you are, and the work that you've done over the last uh, many years. I was born in Sri Lanka. I am very proud to be Tamil, like our first female and Black and Indian Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, I was raised in Long Beach, California, and have been on the East Coast for most of my life and in New York City for the past, uh, this would be my 26th year. My career started um, after college when I worked for Anna DeVere Smith, um, another great artist of the Aspen Institute. And I worked for her on Twilight Los Angeles 1992. And then I was the uh, youth coordinator for the Women's Conference in China for the NGO Forum. So those were kind of the two defining um, moments in my life that set the trajectory for my entire career. And I feel like I've been winging it, um, but also just very grateful that the work I've done has brought me into collaborations with you, with Hank Willis Thomas, with Micheline Thomas, with Catherine Gund, and with so many wonderful organizations. You know, I make my living as uh, a producer and a filmmaker mostly. Uh, and the writing is, uh, speaks to the introverted part of me. Uh, I, I, I love it. Um, I think by nature, I'm a writer, but I, I'm good at producing. So I, I'm lucky that my producing brings me uh, into these beautiful projects. You know, I remember so well, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, about the book. I, I do think that it's important given your background, where you come from, the kind of work that you've been doing, the work that you did for so many years uh, around social justice, uh, which has really been such a steep part of your life. And of course, I remember um, the day that, um, that you met um, Eric Schneiderman. Uh, uh, we were both at the National Democratic Convention in Philadelphia. Tell me about that first meeting in Philadelphia when you first met him and um, the excitement that you felt around your initial introduction to him as this important figure uh, in New York? Well, it felt fortuitous at the time. Uh, in retrospect, it feels uh, uh, unfortunate, but I wasn't even planning to be at the convention center that night for the DNC, but um, a friend offered me a pass. I took it. Uh, I was in the box of Governor Ed Rendell and I was seated on a stool and I was taking notes. Uh, I'm an intrepid note taker. Um, so I had my little notebook and pen and I could feel a man looking at me um, from the side. And so I looked to the side and we exchanged glances and I kept writing. And then he came over to me and he said, you're writing notes like that was surprising because most people were on their laptops or their phones. Um, and uh, he asked if I knew who he was and I said, no. And he said, where are you from? And I said, New York. And then he said, well, I'm your lawyer. Um, I, I'm smiling right now because that was a weird introduction, but it then became more about exchanging ideas. He was very interested in meditation and spirituality, spirituality uh, which I am as well, and progressive causes. We had both gone to Harvard, uh, he for law school, me for undergrad and grad, and we had both studied Chinese. Um, and it felt like this nerdy flirtation um, that showed we had many overlapping interests. So it started out like a fairy tale. And uh, I remember being in the car with you when we were leaving the DNC to drive back to New York and Eric had told me that he would call me and he called when you and I were together. Right. And Carrie, I was wondering if you could describe what that moment felt like for you when that call came. 
Well, of course, you know, we had been talking, I think, a bit about him um, when he called. And um, you were very excited. Um, wanted, of course, to know more about him. Wanted to see him again. Um, and in the middle of discussing that, he called you. I mean, we were in the middle of really talking about life, your life and what you wanted to do, what you wanted to pursue at this point going forward when you received this sort of extraordinary phone call. Um, and we were both excited. I was excited for you. I, I thought the world of him, I thought that the work that he was trying to do uh, for the state of New York was important. Um, and, so, and so we were both, I think, excited and looking forward to what it might mean. Now, I think that this is really sort of an interesting thing that he called um, because I think um, uh, two things. One is that um, as you began dating more, as you began seeing one another, as you entered the relationship, um, and we were working together, of course, we were working together on my project, Grace Notes, um, he began calling you more and more and more and more and every few minutes and constantly. And I thought, well, doesn't he have a job? So, 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 so two things um, about this. One is one of the things that, that, that we've posed that, that perpetrators come in all stripes, all colors, and that perpetrators are, um, are also stalkers. That they, are, that they are predators by nature and that they're looking for the weakest link in the chain. They're looking for a set of weaknesses um, that they gravitate toward. And so I was wondering about this idea that they come in all stripes and shapes, right? Um, and where does this sort of abusive behavior come from and why is it normalized and then what needs to change? Well, perpetrators come in all stripes and also a victim looks like all of us. And it was very important for me uh, to share the micro details of what I experienced with Eric Schneiderman so that I could help shift the perception of what a victim looks like, that even fierce women get abused. Now for where this behavior comes from, it's the patriarchy. It's the conditioning of men to dominate and women to be silent. And I remember vividly the conversations that you and I would have about this when I was figuring out whether or not to come forward and I asked you if I was doing the right thing. And you told me, unfortunately, yes. But we also talked about how it's a woman's place in this world to be silent. So I feel that by sharing our stories um, about these painful subjects, by doing the storytelling, that we take the stigma out of it because stigma comes from secrecy. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think there's a whole ecosystem overhaul that needs to happen to chip away at the conditioning that normalizes the cycle of violence and that chips away at the patriarchy. It's about education from the time we are young because millions of people experience intimate partner violence before they turn 18. Mm -hmm. So I want high school students to read the book. Mm -hmm. And also the laws need to change. There needs to be a more victim-centered approach in the laws. There needs to be more restorative justice in tandem with law enforcement. And also there needs to be more government support to provide resources to the organizations that provide shelter, legal services, and mental health counseling to the communities that they are closest to. I think that these are really excellent points. You know, th these, you know, what you've just said, I think is really so profound and so important. And yet the, one of the things that, that, that I think is also important uh, that I wanted to ask you about um, is at what moment you know, can you can you mark a moment when actually you began to began to understand that you were indeed involved in an abusive relationship? And what were some of the first clues that you were indeed involved in an abusive relationship? Because it seems to me that one of the things that has to happen is that is that is that women need to understand the signs and the markers 
of what abuse actually means in order to protect themselves at the onset of an abusive affair? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and it's largely the reason why I wrote the book to walk the reader through the stages that I went through to get entangled in an abusive relationship. Because when you're going through those stages, it's not so easy to recognize it because it's this drip, 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 uh, this escalation of, of manifestations. So I wasn't prepared for my path to intersect with an abuser. I had never been in an abusive relationship before. I wasn't prepared for the grooming and the gaslighting and the manipulation so that by the time I was entangled, it was very hard to see outside of it. Abusers are very skilled at tapping into their victim's weakness and twisting it. So in my case, it was about the scars that run down my torso from cancer surgery. Uh, when he would first look at my scars during the fairy tale stage, he would look at them as if they were a badge of courage. As time went by, he would look at my scars as if they were ugly and he wanted me to get plastic surgery to remove them. He even had a plastic surgeon that he wanted me to see. Another example was my hair, which you know today is straight, it's winter, but in the winter, uh, in, in the summertime when it's humid, it, 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 is, it gets big, which I love. Um, but he always wanted me to straighten my hair or to wear it up. And then also the uh, racism in the bedroom, the racism and the physical violence. Uh, which was which combined with the uh, verbal abuse and the coercive control, it, it, it he he broke me down, mm -hmm. and I knew it was wrong along the way. I did tell a number of close friends, my trust, and also my therapist about his controlling behavior and his drinking, which was escalating, especially after the election in two thousand sixteen. But at the time, I thought that the abuse was specific to me and that I had done something to spark it because he was so good at customizing the abuse to me. I was also duped because so many people worshipped him. So many people had encouraged me to be in a relationship with him. And uh, he was friends with his ex-wife, who was also his advisor, and I consider his prime enabler. I'm sure that she has a story to tell, too that she might never share, but nonetheless, her power was entwined with him. And also he was surrounded by meditators. I'm not gonna say their names. They are very prominent meditation teachers who were like a cover for him, a shield. So there, there's so many layers involved with how one gets entangled in an abusive relationship. One is the drip, drip, drip that I just described. Another are the enablers that are around them. And also that there isn't enough information and storytelling out there so that other people can spot, stop and prevent intimate partner violence in their own lives. But the turning point for me, because I wasn't telling people about the physical violence, That's is when a friend- Didn't share it with me until the very end. Yes. And it was a mutual friend of ours, who's like my sister, who, knew that something was wrong, she could tell. There were a number of friends who for many months had felt that I was subdued, that I wasn't myself. Um, and this friend said, hey, um, can you talk? And she started asking questions and I told her that things were rocky. Um, and then she suddenly asked, does he hit you? Hmm. And those four words blew my mind and I wasn't gonna lie to her. I said, yes. And she, knowing that she was not equipped to then take me to where I needed to go, said, would you be willing to speak with a friend of mine? And that friend is a domestic violence expert. And I spoke with that, I said, yes. And I spoke with that friend a few days later and she had me describe my experience from beginning to end. And she said, Tanya, what you experienced is classic domestic violence and the scales fell off of my eyes and I never looked back. And she also said, you're probably not the first person that he's done this to. And of course, as we know from the New Yorker investigation by Jane Mayer and Ronan Farrow, I indeed was not the first and I was part of a pattern. You're coming forward when you did in the midst of the, the Me Too movement, 
and so much was going on. So many of our, quote, heroes were falling by the wayside. So many of these liberals were falling by the wayside. So many men that we knew. Of course, we made a project together that lists uh, any number of men, for the most part, who've been charged with, um, with sexual harassment and or abuse of women. Uh, and when we did our project several years ago, maybe we had a list of over 200 known men, public figures, actors, uh, movie moguls, uh, and on and on and on that we uh, began, began to list. But I want to ask you a question, uh, not because I believe that, that, that victims are the blame, that is by no means the implication here, but I'm always wondering about um, one's culpability and what happens um, that when one is abused, uh, yes, we understand that there is manipulation, uh, distortion, um, but what is, what is, how are you culpable or how are victims culpable and actually what happens to them? Or do you believe that they are? Well, I believe that society is culpable. I, again, it's the whole ecosystem is culpable. And uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is to give people kind of a, a guide for how to avoid an abusive relationship, to get out of an abusive relationship, to help a loved one get out of an abusive relationship, but also to provide a roadmap for coming forward and sharing stories about intimate violence. Because on, by sharing our stories, we can realize that we are one of many and also begin to identify solutions. Now, interviewers get criticized for asking victims why they stayed. But for myself, it was important for me to ask that question so that I could understand how I got into the relationship in the first place and also excavate the fractures within myself that I needed to heal. You know, it was not that I, uh, it, we are all the culmination of the experiences in our life. And at the point when I met Eric, even though I felt very secure in my work and in my friendships, uh, I was weakened with regard to romance. Because as you know, Carrie, I had come on the heels of a series of miscarriages, two types of cancer, surgery, and then divorce. Mm -hmm. And even though I felt like I was ready for a relationship, the reality, of course, was that I was ripe for the breaking. Yes. And Eric just entered my life during the perfect storm. You know, I think that, you know, your coming forward is so extraordinary. And one of the things that, I, that I'm impressed with by the book, actually, is the is the, the its directness, its um, openness, its willing to share the sort of point by point by point ways in which um, domestic abu abuse reveals itself, revealed itself to you. And I think that this idea of storytelling is absolutely critical and really important. And I understand that based on this, actually, that, you know, since the publication of the book, several other women, actually, who have been abused also by Eric Schneiderman have also come forward. Is that true? Yes. Uh, during the writing of the book, I had multiple women reach out to me um, I, they have not come forward, so I write about them in vague terms anonymously. I met with one of them. Uh, it, it, it just shows me what a serial predator he was. Mm -hmm. And then after the book came out, I got an, a note that made my heart stop. And it was a woman who had dated him four decades ago and she needed surgery for an injury he had caused. And that's when I went, I won't, I won't use expletives during this conversation, um, but I had a lot of expletives going through my head. And it was one of the few times that I felt, I felt rage at him because I wasn't angry at Eric for all the time that I was getting out of the relationship. I was really focused on myself and my recovery, but because I've 
come to this place where I'm my strongest self ever and feel liberated because I wrote my way out of the darkness. I felt rage when I got that email. Now it was about two weeks ago. Um, and since receiving that note, I received yet another one last week from a woman who had dated him almost, uh, almost 15 years ago, who had also been abused by him. So if there are those four additional women plus the women that were in the New Yorker story, and this spans 40 years at least, I just wonder how many more women he abused. And this is why I feel it is so important to speak out against predators. The new cycle passes, your life goes on. You know, I had to keep showing up for work. I didn't have the option not to show up for work because I needed to make a living. And I'm just grateful for the friends and colleagues and people like you who kept me moving forward. But um, it, it, it's like, you never know whose life you can be saving by speaking out. So for me, it was more about conscience than courage. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I had a choice. I think it's a combination of both. I think that, there, it, that it, it was very courageous and bold um, because you took um, a, a, a huge public stand against a very, very, very powerful political figure. And so I'm wondering also about um, the political, the political implications of your stepping forward based on who Eric Snyderman was to the state of New York. There were many people whom I had confided in um, and was seeking advice when I was deciding whether to come forward who um, tried to dissuade me from doing so because they felt that Eric was doing important work and that it would, and that we needed him. Um, but the chorus of people who were telling me that I knew what I had to do were much stronger and much more rational. So I listened to them. Mm -hmm. um, and also I had um, confidence that, and uh, no matter what great work he was doing, uh, a man who championed women publicly but abused them privately should not be a th the attorney general of the state of New York. It was not my intention that he resign. It was my intention to protect other women. But of course, because of the airtight reporting of the New Yorker within three hours, he did resign. Um, and also, you know, these cults of personality that form around powerful people, rich people, talented people who are abusers are damaging to the people who are in those cults and really damaging to society. The myth of indispensability of these people who are abusers, uh, it, it, it's, a false, it's a false narrative. And we need to shift that narrative because of course, as happened in my situation, Eric Schneiderman resigned. He was replaced very quickly with Barbara Underwood. And then uh, Letitia James became the first female and black attorney general of New York state. So we did end up with a better advocate and a better champion um, who, you know, walks the walk. I think this is amazing. What, what an incredible story and an incredible journey. And you've talked a lot about, you know, in, in t today and the way in which you wanted to support other women, which I think is so important. You've talked about sisterhood, you've talked about friendship, and you've also talked about the role of white women in relationship to, um, to this uh, moment. What's, what, what do you think that role is? And do you think that role is different for white women than it is for women of color? Yes. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to point out that, you know, white women, like women of color, black women, brown women, it's not a monolith. But when you look at statistically how white women vote in the elections, they're putting loyalty over conscience. And there's a line in Heidi Schreck's extraordinary play, What the Constitution Means to Me, where she asks the question, when will white women stop betraying women? And I, I write about going to see that play in the book and what an impact it had on me. Uh, I think the call is for uh, white women to examine uh, 
how they contribute to the patriarchy. I mean, I do believe that white female patriarchy is a thing. And I feel that we need a war between feminists and patriarchs and those on the side of feminists are not only women and those on the side of patriarchs are not only men. The goal is to get to a world that is safer and fairer for all people. So it's about finding ways that we can come together in this fight that mm -hmm. I think is essential. Oh, I think this is just so, so, so wonderful to hear. I, I so appreciate the clarity of, of understanding. You know, I was going to ask you something about whether or not it was painful to revisit all of this, but it's clear that it really isn't, that you've really found your ground, the ground beneath your feet in order to push forward. And so before I open this up to uh, other questions from the audience, which I'm sure there must be tons of, I have one final question. I understand that the book has actually now, which I think is extraordinary, been optioned. Uh, yes, uh, it was unexpected, um, but I was approached by Joanna Coles, who knew that I was writing a book, and uh, she asked if she could read the manuscript, and she read it very quickly and um, said beautiful things to me about the book and that she wanted to develop it into a series. So now ABC Signature Disney Television has optioned it. It is in active development. Um, we're meeting with writers and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, it's going to be a dramatization. It's not a docu-series. And uh, I, I'm, I'm most grateful about it being turned into a series because it'll, the message will just reach an, an exponentially larger audience. And um, I just wanna know because Carrie, you're such a key figure in the book throughout Who's gonna play you? Oh my God! Who's gonna play me? Who's gonna play you? That's the question. You're the you're the you're the protagonist. I'm just a, a sidekick. But what do you have in mind before we open this up to uh, the audience? Well, um, can I say who I think should play you? <laughs> who should play you? But of course, you are our, our guest. You can say anything you want. I my dream is for Alfre Woodard to play you. <laughs> She's fantastic. She's amazing. She's amazing. And what about who's going to play you? Well, my dream, and this would be quite an upgrade, is for, now don't laugh, um, is for Priyanka Chopra Jonas to play me. Oh, bravo. Well, she's a phenomenal actress. And she has a book that just came out too. You know, our books came out in the same month, which I think is quite extraordinary. So I'm you know, crossing fingers. Well, this is amazing. Thank you again for the clarity, for uh, the bravery, for stepping out, for doing what a lot of women don't do, Tanya, because many of them remain silent for years and years and years and years. And sometimes they don't make it through. You've made it through, you've come through the other side, you can see, you can see what it was with great clarity um, and that it toppled um, someone so significant in our in our culture, but who has wound up being so disappointing uh, for who and what he should be, um, I think is really um, um, a commendable step on your behalf. And now I'd like to sort of uh, go to um, uh, some of the questions that are here. And I think we've got just a few, we only have a few more minutes, but, um, um, there's a, one question that comes in. What was um, his relationship? What was his relationship, his relationship history before he met you? And I think you've probably answered that question. He was married, had seen many, many other people, and he had only been recently divorced. Is that right? No, he had been divorced for about 20 years um, by the time I met him, but his ex wife. Um, continued to be a close confidant and advisor. She's a communications and political strategist. And um, that was one of the reasons why I thought, well, he's friends with his ex-wife. So when the abuse started happening with me, I did think it was specific to me. Um, his relationship history, I don't 
uh, obviously it was well documented in the New Yorker. He had a string of, he was a serial monogamist. So it wasn't like Harvey Weinstein where he had um, a different women that he abused, you know, in isolated incidences. Eric would be in these committed relationships where he was able to ex abuse women kind of serially um, over a long period of time. And I feel like we are at the next wave of Me Too, which is about intimate violence in committed relationships. There's another question that can you speak to the role of female, of female patriarchs and your reflections on women who may be enabling their behavior or this behavior of male, um, pe uh, perpetu um, excuse me, perpetuators? Well, I feel the next wave of Me Too is also about calling out the enablers, including the female patriarchs. Yes. I was made aware of many powerful women who behind the scenes were trying to discredit me and the New Yorker. Um, and I have found out some of their, some more names even recently. I'm not gonna say them on this Zoom. I will share them with you privately, Carrie, but um, it is shocking. Mm -hmm. It is shocking. They claim to be feminists publicly. They are very prominent. Um, and I think it's because, you know, they didn't want to see one of their own taken down. They are transactional. As I said before, it's loyalty over conscience and their power was intertwined with Eric's and he was their conduit to power as well. And I doubt that the current attorney general of New York state is that same conduit for them. So what needs to happen is calling out the um, enablers because the perpetrators don't get away with it, usually without an enabler vouching for them. And, you know, with one of the women who reached out to me, well, two of the women who reached out to me who had been victims of Eric Schneiderman, they had been introduced to him by other people. And in one case, introduced to Eric after the New Yorker story came out. Wow. Did you ever feel endangered? Did you ever, were you ever afraid, right, in this relationship? Did you feel as though, or, or even now, do you, do you have any sort of reservations? Do you feel comfortable in speaking out? Do you feel as though you might be in danger in any way, politically or socially? I mean, I think we are all in danger all the time because of the violence that's all around us. And the pandemic has only heightened the ways in which we are all vulnerable. But for me, I'm grateful for my friends and community that um, surrounds me with love and comfort. Uh, at the time that I was coming forward, yes, I was very afraid. I was, uh, my abuser was the top law enforcement officer in New York state. I had, faith and trust in David Remnick and Jane Mayer and uh, Ronan Farrow of The New Yorker. I knew that their reporting was solid, um, but I had no idea how the story would land. So I envisioned that if it didn't land well, that I might have to hide, that I might have to leave the country. I did a security training um, a couple of months before the story came out. Um, and also I read The Gift of Fear which I feel is essential reading. And what's been really gratifying is that some people have described my book as a companion book to The Gift of Fear. And The Gift of Fear is by Gavin De Becker. And it, um, a key takeaway for me is that there's good fear and bad fear. Good fear is when we rely on our intuition and it helps us live our best lives. Bad fear is that which prevents us from living our best lives. So I've embraced good fear by taking precautions for myself. I did not know what resources Eric might deploy um, after the story came out because he had many resources at his disposal. And also I have friends who've dated powerful men and still live in mortal fear of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, it, 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 it is not surprising to me, though I think it's shocking to the general public, what people in positions of power will stoop to when they are called out, especially when they have their enablers and infinite financial resources. So I didn't know what would happen to me, but uh, 
thank goodness he resigned within three hours because he was instantly stripped of that power of being the top law enforcement officer in New York State. What do we do now about Como? What are your th thoughts around what's happening with the governor of New York? Do you have any thoughts and feelings about that at the moment? Well, I believe in due process. I believe in establishing the veracity of the allegations and the credibility of the accusers. There are now six, I believe. Um, and I believe in an in independent investigation, which Attorney General Letitia James um, has ordered. And I think that we should wait for the results of that investigation before jumping to conclusions. Um, what I do find uh, notable about the allegations is that these are women who are um, expressing them independently of each other and they are expressing eerily similar patterns of inappropriate behavior. But it's uh, very important to delineate between the types of harassment and violence. So what I experienced was intimate violence in a committed relationship and it was physical violence. What's being described in the Cuomo allegations are inappropriate touching, groping, sexual harassment, that kind of power over culture um, that men think they can get away with when they're in those positions, such as Governor Cuomo. Um, I think it is going to become increasingly distracting um, to have these allegations continue to you know, drip, drip, drip. I've been disappointed in the way the media has been covering these stories because I, I wish that they had done uh, a thoroughly investigated multiple people as a group um, coming forward against the governor so that he doesn't have the chance to keep digging in his heels. But right now it's like one story, one story, one story. And I know from having had a conversation um, that, and this was definitely the case in my story as well, sometimes the women don't want to be part of a group. Mm -hmm. They want that limelight for themselves. And I hate saying that out loud, but it is, um, it's a problem because it, it would have been so much better to have like a surgical strike if indeed these allegations are true rather than these like drip, drip, drip of stories that are becoming distractions. Um, so, I, I mean, what I feel is more important uh, or equally important is I really want to know what happened with the nursing home data and yes. the situation there. But uh, uh, so, yeah, that's my position on Cuomo. I think that there are going to be more women who come forward. Um, and mm -hmm. I hope that the media does a responsible job of reporting it moving forward. I think that what you've done is amazing. I'm encouraging everyone to look at the book. And now I'm going to, um, unfortunately, we have so many questions, so many questions and so many thank yous from, uh, from, from the audience. We'll turn it over to Linda, Linda to close out. And Tanya, thank you again for this amazing book and for the incredible clarity that you've brought to, uh, to this issue. So important. Thank you, Carrie, for being part of my story and part of my life. Bless. Linda? Well, and, and let me add my thanks to both of you for sharing something I know is difficult to hear, but is important. And the only thing I would like to add is that at the back of Tanya's book, um, some questions came through about resources, about what you do. And um, there's a whole list of resources for people who want to reach out for some help in getting out of abusive relationships. So uh, you can check the book and, and Tanya has put her, um, her email uh, contact information in uh, the chat. So you can certainly reach out to her. Um, is that okay, Tanya, if somebody needs to um, find their way out? It is okay, but um, because I am not an expert, I, I, I encourage people to refer to the resources. There are dozens of resources in the book. It was very important for me to provide that because there is no one size fits all for how to get out of an abusive relationship. Although abuse is common, every victim is different. 
So I, I, I encourage people to refer to those resources. And if you are the loved one of somebody in an abusive relationship, you could be their lifeline by providing those resources to the victim. Thank you. And thank you both again for a very important conversation. I'd also like to thank once again, Ambassador and Mrs. Gildenhorn for funding these conversations and allowing us to bring topics like this out in the open. And uh, don't forget, you can buy Tanya's book at a 10% discount by going to Politics and Prose, and we'll be sending you a link to that offer after the program. So thank you all for tuning in and um, thank you both for sharing your story.